the right field line. Pretty well hit. Lafarn way. It's the right way here tonight. Yogi Berra said it's 90% mental. The other half is physical. My name is Ryan Lavarnway, Major League Catcher and Minor League Grinder, and I've spent the last 15 years playing professional baseball while evolving my mindset. I'm fascinated by optimizing that 90%. In this show, I'll talk to elite athletes and mindset coaches about what makes them tick and how they've overcome obstacles in their own careers on the way to finding success. This is Finding the Way. Hey guys, this is Ryan LaVarnway. Welcome to Finding the Way. Today my guest is Joanna Lohman, soccer superstar, civil rights advocate, equality advocate, total rock star speaker on the keynote speaking circuit now, and I'm so excited to get into this with you, Joanna. Thank you for joining me. You forgot my favorite label, Ryan, which is Celesbian. Rainbow Warrior. Yes, I am everyone's new favorite Celesbian, so you are welcome. Yes. Well, let's let's get into this. You you grew up in Maryland. You went to Penn State, where you won every award on the planet. You were you were <laughs> captain. Let's let's list them. Let's let's laundry list them. You were the first four time All Big Ten selection, four time academic All American, Pennsylvania's NCAA Woman of the Year. Yeah, and uh, and then you try you were about to get drafted into the MLS, and the league folded. Uh, MLS is the men's league, but into the uh, WUSA, and then the league crashed and burned and went bankrupt and folded. What did that do to you, or what? What did that? Where was your mind at when that happened? Oof! You know what? You just asked the the golden question. So that's why I'm here. Only, by the way, yeah, you you've <laughs> done your research. Not only was the league folding, crashing and burning. So I had a vision of I was going to go top five in the draft. Ryan, I was also engaged to be married at this point. Wow. And I was engaged to be married to a man. Wow. No offense to men. I love (laughs) me some men. Not your thing. But you see me now. I'm an androgynous lesbian who rocks the Joe Hawk and who's nicknamed the Rainbow Warrior. So talk about a transformation. So at the exact same time, I with the league folding and uh, I had my first experience with a woman and it was like the heavens parted and the angels came down and ah, I knew in an instant that that was the life I was supposed to live. So I thought I had the American dream, the dream husband, the dream career. I was going to get this house in suburbia, the white picket fence, the 2.3 kids. (laughs) And it was like almost overnight that I lost my job and I lost my husband and I now continue to defy expectations um, as I continue to follow my dream of being a professional soccer player. So we can feel free to double click on any points of that story that I just mentioned. Yes. Double click is, is your term that I am really enjoying right now. Let's double click on your, the dream that you thought you were supposed to live. And, and how other people's expectations or maybe society's expectations, or maybe you put them on yourself. How did that affect what you were, the life you were living and how did you overcome that to become more of your authentic self? I want to say all of the above when it comes to the expectations we face as individuals in this world. Um, this is really what my, my keynote speech now dives into is the concept of being our authentic selves and the daily battle between being who we want to be versus who we are told we should be on a daily basis. We face outside pressures. We face parental expectations. We face cultural religious norms, homophobia, sexism, racism, misogyny. There are, there are social constructs of beauty that we are told to fit into. So we have an unhealthy standard of success that we are told to live up to. And in that unhealthy standard of success, we are asked to bend and break our body and soul into the restrictive boxes that society presents us as options for identity because we are fearful of what we don't know. We are fearful of change. We think different is dangerous. So I, as a society member, want everyone to fit in a nice box and I want to tie it up with a bow. So whenever you step outside of 
societal expectations, gender norms, sexual orientation norms, you are quote unquote coming out, right? Everybody at some point in their life comes out. You're coming out of your comfort zone. No, I don't mean every listener of this podcast is queer in some sort of way, but you will hopefully at some point define your authenticity. You will pivot from the path that society has put you on and you will do what you want to do. That could look like being an artist when both of your parents are doctors. That could look like taking a gap year after high school. That could look like leaving a religion you were born into. That could look like leaving your current career and stepping off and you know being your own boss, running your own company. So there are so many ways that individuals can come out. And when you come out, essentially, you are stepping into your own truth. You are finding your own authenticity. So for me coming out when I was, I was 20, 21 years old, old, Ryan, when I came out and the league also folded. And when you come out, it's for a lack of better term, you have to mourn the death of who you thought you were going to be. I thought I was going to be a professional athlete in the WSA. I thought I was going to have the husband and the kids. And when you shatter your own vision for your life or the vision that society, your parents have for you, you have to mourn the death of what that vision was. And one of my favorite quotes is from Mike Tyson, right? The boxing undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. We all have a plan until we get punched in the face. So my coming out, my experience with a woman was my version. I call it getting hit by the gay stick. <laughs> I got punched in the face, right? I thought I had a plan. I had a plan and I got punched in the face. And that's the beauty of adversity. So very often we shy away from facing things that are difficult because it is scary and it's uncomfortable. But when we face adversity, it is some, for some form of rejection, right, of self. And the pieces of our identity are on the floor. And that is an opportunity for us to shed old beliefs and behaviors and norms and conventions that no longer serve our higher purpose. And we get to pick up the pieces of our identity that actually fit us and who we want to be. And we get to build a bigger, better version of ourselves. So that is what I was able to do when I got hit by the gay stick, right? I, I realized that I had to say goodbye to hetero Joe and I had to say hello to homo Joe. And here I am on your podcast. There we go. <laughs> there, there's, I'm going to use your, your term again, double click. There's two things I want to double click from, from what you were just talking about. The, the first is understanding who you are and something you talked about in one of your other podcasts you've been on as I was doing my research on you is the importance of experimentation and sampling. Mm -hmm. the testing lab of life you called it social emotional physical i feel like as a 35 year old i just started doing this a couple years ago yeah i grew up in a household and let, let's just even use food for an example my my dad grew up in small town indiana he likes red meat and potatoes and and maybe broccoli and like maybe chicken okay so that's the house i grew up in and I grew up in Southern California. I did not have an avocado. I did not have a shrimp. I didn't try sushi until I moved out of the house and went to college. And then when, when Jamie and I started dating, she basically gave me an ultimatum on our third date of, you don't want to try Thai food. If you're not willing to try new things, this isn't going to work out. Since then, I have been the most adventurous eater of anyone that I know. And I found the things that I actually like. And... and I didn't know what kind of coffee I liked. So I tried every coffee that there is. And now I, now I know. And now I can take more ownership of the things that I like and the person that I am. How, how did you come to value experimentation and sampling in the testing lab of life? You picked a winner with Jamie. I, I, I like her already, even though I haven't met her. So that's pretty awesome. I think that... We often, to use a term from Michael Gervais, who's a um, high performance you know, psychologist, who's worked with the Seattle Seahawks, many athletes, it's a term called identity foreclosure. So very often we foreclose our identity to options because we say things like, I am an athlete, I am a student, I am a mother. And when we say statements like this, of course we are describing our own identity, but it becomes it becomes our existence. 
and we foreclose who we are to other options. And the way that I love to approach it is a fun game, right? Instead of saying, hey, Ryan, are you funny? I'd say, hey, Ryan, how are you funny? Hey, Ryan, are you smart? Ryan, how are you smart? Because as human beings, we are all things. And we need to have the ability and the and the the boldness and the courage to explore all of our dimensions because we have a multitude of dimensions as a human being and being your authentic self this is a myth that i would love to debunk it doesn't mean showing up one way and one way only when you are your authentic self you have a comfort in your skin because you've discovered all of your dimensions and I can say, Ryan, that in this moment, this scenario calls for this strength. Another scenario may call for a different strength. And you are able to deploy all of your strengths in the way the scenario calls for. That's being your authentic self. You can play different roles because different moments call for different qualities from an individual. They call for different characteristics from Joe Loman. And since I have a comfort in my own skin, I know when I you know what I should sit back and listen, or this is a moment for me to speak up because not every moment is the same. So I think in my laboratory of life, I have failed epically, Ryan. Like I call myself a failure expert. I have been forced to grow after falling on my face more times than most. I say my lowlights exceed my highlights. And it's those moments of adversity where you look in the mirror and you see yourself in a new light because you've discovered parts of yourself that you never knew were possible. For instance, tearing my ACL in what should have been the best season of my life. Here I was, I was an athlete, right? I was a soccer player. And all of a sudden, when you tear your ACL, those pieces of your identity are shattered. So who are you? What do you contribute to the world off of the field? And I had a moment through my ACL injury to discover who I was outside of being an athlete. My first time going to a pride parade, I filmed a documentary, right? I was able to discover all of these dimensions of myself outside of the sport that showed me I had so much to contribute to the world and had nothing to do with the ball at my feet. And so it was one of my darkest, darkest moments, right? Tearing my ACL on my dream season. And yet, I look back and I say it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was able to see myself as a whole human being. And instead of infractions, which so very often we see ourselves in fractions because we foreclose our identity to all of the beautiful options that are out there in this world. I want, I want to dig into the, the failure piece a little bit more, but before we transition away from this laboratory of life thing, it sounds like you're saying that of the thousands of different qualities you could describe a human, everyone has a little of everything. It's like there's a sliding scale. Imagine yes. there's like a one to 10 and you, you might be a one or a 0 0.5 on some of the things, but you still have that quality in some regards. Yeah. And at any different point, that one or 0 0.5 might play up in a different scenario. And maybe you're now you're a five out of 10 in that yeah. situation. I, I love that, that concept. Yeah. Can I, can I give a visual metaphor for this? Like imagine you are your own DJ of life and you're up there and you're turning dials, right? You're turning some up in certain situations, you're turning some down and you have every single dial to turn. And when you're your authentic self, when you have emotional intelligence, you know when to turn what dial. And that way you have control, right? Like you have, you take the power back because you know when to deploy certain strengths. You also know your own imperfections. Like an authentic person knows when to say, I don't know the answer to that, or that's, that's not one of my strengths, right? You know, your own gaps and your own weaknesses, and you can embrace your imperfections because you realize that every human being is a work in progress. And if you think you've made it, you haven't, you think, you know, everything, you know, nothing, right? So the authentic human can sit back humbly and say, I can stay quiet in this moment, or I know where I am in this space. I love that. That's such a beautiful metaphor. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's get into the failure piece. So the the UWSA, sorry, WUSA, WUSA folds. You, yeah. you you go to Sweden, and, and then you end up going to Tokyo for a while to train. 
And mm-hmm. I, you say that you were the worst player on the field by far. Uh, the other girls were literally running circles around you. And it proved to yourself that you can put yourself in a very vulnerable position to get better. I also have quotes from you talking about failure that adver- adversity builds character. Doing what you love requires sacrifice. Um, you've enjoyed tons of success, obviously, in your career. You were the, the, the first woman to ever have her number retired by the Washington spirit when you retired mm-hmm. in 2019. Uh, but it was the periods of struggle that you're the most proud of. When you were knocked down, you were cut, you were forced to figure something out. The scrapes, cuts, bumps, and scars have defined who you are. How has failure become so important to you as a person that's had so much success in their career and you've, you've accomplished these things that there are millions of kids out there that want to accomplish, but you can admit and embrace that the failure is what helped you get there. It's, it's great to hear my old interviews because I, at least I'm still preaching the same messages, right? I'm very authentic in that sense. And I've, if anything, I'm, I'm even more deeply entrenched in the opportunity that adversity presents us. And I say that because you use the word success and you use it in the traditional sense, trophies, awards, accolades, leagues that I've played in championship games. Those are great, Ryan. Like the traditional sense of success is wonderful. That is all outside of our control. Those are all outcomes that you are describing. You're all describing results and outcomes. True success to me is how you show up in this world, right? That your greatest accomplishment is is being yourself in a world that's trying to make you something else, to quote the famous poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I believe that success is defined by our evolution and not our conclusion. I believe success is defined by the amount of adversity we overcome and not what we declare as income. And my favorite one is success is defined by how much we molt versus how much we make. And the molting piece, you know, listeners probably like WTF, like what is she talking about? And this is the current keynote speech that I'm giving is, you know, I'm a celesbian from the great state of Maryland. Our state animal is the crab. I'm also a cancer. So if you do research on a Dungeness crab, they molt 30 to 40 times in their lifetime. What does it mean to molt? You shed your old skin and you grow into a new one. You regrow limbs. You get rid of old beliefs, right? Parasites and barnacles off your old shell to grow into a better one. You grow bigger and larger. You change your body shape. And the stimulus for this molting is adversity. It is discomfort. So I no longer see life as a race to something. What are we racing towards? Life is not a destination. Life is an orientation. Life is about showing up as a Dungeness crab and having the strength and the courage to transform throughout our lifetime. It is the evolution. Our superpower as a human species is transformation. We change so much over our lifetime. So no longer am I looking at my success by the amount that I get paid in my last keynote, I'm seeing success as the influence that I've made on that audience or how I've changed through that process or holding my baby daughter and looking in the mirror and seeing my wrinkles and smile lines and you know, feeling like my mind is blown that I have a daughter, right? Like that is success to me because it's through the challenge that we change, right? And everyone in life is going to go through some sort of struggle. That's what we resonate with. And it's through that struggle that we find a deeper sense of who we are. And to me, your character, how you stand in times of challenge and controversy is the definition of success. It is no longer the trophy. It is no longer the medal around my neck. It is no longer the outcome that we describe. It is the orientation of how I show up in this world. I really hope I get to see your keynote someday soon. (laughs) <laughs> because that was so that was so inspiring and i love what you're doing you're, you're giving your keynote not just to business audiences but to school children 
You've, you've written a book, Raising Tomorrow's Champions, what the women's national soccer team teaches us about grit, authenticity, and winning. And you've been in this space where you meet coaching kids and parenting head on because, mm -hmm. because that's where you have such an opportunity to affect lives. I have, I have another quote from you that sports is the only environment where you have controlled and public suffering. It's the only arena that tra tra trains you to face your fears. And it's the only arena that forces you to fall down and get back up, make mistakes and pick yourself up back up again in front of a ton of people. Yeah. I, I know my, I can point exactly to my worst baseball game of all time because I was number three on the not top 10 on sports center. And I got to watch it every <laughs> hour for the rest of the week on wow. national television. Yeah. You just had a daughter recently. Congratulations, Luna. She's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. When did when did affecting the next generation and, and helping parents raise a great you know next generation of, of children and young athletes? When did that become so important to you? And how did you get involved before you were even a parent yourself? It has been important to me for my entire career, and I say that because I came out when I was twenty one. And while doing research for the book, Raising Tomorrow's Champions, I discovered that I was one of the first publicly open gay professional female soccer players. So even before Megan Rapinoe, even before Abby Wambach, I was out and open. And the response that I got from fans when I showed up as my authentic self on the field was just resounding. It and with the privilege that I had as a professional athlete, the platform, plus being an American, right? A white American in a sport where I felt safe to be queer, I realized that that privilege is a responsibility because I've traveled around the world. I've been to countries where it is illegal. You can get arrested for being a homosexual. And here I am sitting in this safe space as a queer women's soccer player. And for me, that is a responsibility for to speak for those who have been forced into silence. And so it has always been a mission of mine to advocate for those who are forced into that silence. And as I lived my truth, as I showed up unabashedly myself with my, you know, masculine presenting ways, my muscles, my mohawk, I realized that I had an opportunity to expand the definition of what a woman looks like. And through that expansion, Ryan, I faced a ton of resistance. You know, people call me, sir. It's so uncomfortable to walk into bathrooms through airport, airport, uh, metal detectors. It's like a gender war zone. So I am facing resistance on my social media. You know, every single day that I show up as my authentic self, I'm receiving pushback. And this is the pushback that we talked about earlier. It's the outside pressures that we face to fit and break our soul into a certain restrictive box. And I live a life now where if I'm not facing resistance, then I'm not pushing boundaries enough. I realized that I was put on this planet to, to push those boundaries. And so it's always been important for me to show up in the world authentically, knowing that I'm making the path for someone who walks behind me more comfortable. I'm making them feel more comfortable in their own skin by taking this resistance, right? By taking those bullets, maybe someone behind me is protected. And it is needed even more these days with all the bills that are being passed to ban trans athletes, right? Tennessee just passed a law banning drag queens. I mean, we're living in a world that is incredibly divisive and polarized. And so it's even more important for me now to stand in my truth and to speak loudly because of the political world that we live in. So it has been part just like a mission of mine and also a, a, a responsibility that I felt I feel like I have with the platform that I have as a professional athlete. And, and thank you for doing that because it, it's hard to do since I've announced, yeah. I mean, it, it's in no way comparing or contrasting at all. But since I've announced playing for team Israel, I've faced something similar as far as pushback Whereas I have every other advantage in in the world, you know, I'm a, I'm a white guy mm -hmm. that lives in America. Like there's, there's nothing else that people could say I have going against me. And as soon as I had one chink in my armor, I started to feel yeah. 
a, a tiny percentage of what you're saying. But as I grew to value that and, and values is something that you talk about a lot also, as I grew to value that and leaning into it instead of leaning away or shying away from it, it became to me, it, it started to mean even more to me. Yeah. You talk about how the things that you care about are worth failing for. Yeah. The things you care about are worth taking risks, looking silly or dumb for. Finding your values. How How is it that you found your values or, or what steps did you and Melody take to establish the values that you're going to raise Luna with and the values that you're yeah. going to go through your life with? Is there a, a process or, or a conversation that's specific to creating the values that you're going to live by? What's interesting is that I had a conversation with a good friend of mine and to give a little background, you know, to create a child as a same sex couple, you're going to have one egg and then you'll have a sperm donor. So you have to choose whose egg you're going to use. And for Luna, we use my wife's egg. So it's Melody's egg and a sperm donor. And so genetically speaking, DNA there is no part of Joe Loman and Luna. And I think at first that can be a difficult thing to accept for many parents is that they don't have DNA in their, in their child. And then I took a step back and I had a conversation with a great friend of mine and they said, what an opportunity for you. Because so very often as parents, we're constantly looking for ourselves and our children. Oh, I'm good at math. Luna's going to be good at math. Or I was a good soccer player. Luna's going to be a great soccer player. And we are creating those expectations without even knowing it that we're placing on our child. And for me, my gift to Luna, and I thought a lot about what I wanted to say to her when she came out of the womb. And I wanted to say three words. I wanted to say, I trust you. I wanted to say those words because I believe trust is the highest form of love. It is love without control. It is leadership while letting go. And as a parent to Luna, I want to give her space. I want her to give her space to write her own story because so very often we try to write it for our children. And I have an opportunity as the parent who has no DNA in Luna to, to really take that step back and to see her for exactly who she is and not try to see parts of myself in her. And I, I trust her. I trust that she's going to know herself way better than I ever will. And I trust that she will be able to navigate this world of challenge, change, adversity, and pressure if I can give her space to do so. And so that's the value that I'm truly trying to live through is to allow Luna to live her own dream and to be the hero of her own story. And I say that in a way of like, as parents, I'm fully aware that we really are the gatekeepers of our children's joy. And if we're the gatekeeper, we have, we can give them full access to that joy. And that space to me is the access for her to thrive as her true authentic self without me trying to place these limits on her. And Luna's going to be, Luna's going to be a rock star, whatever she decides <laughs> to do. Uh, yes, she will. Absolutely. <laughs> Before I let you go, I always ask all of my guests this one question to wrap up. If there's a, a young person out there, whether they're an athlete or not, because you're kind of um, um, a mentor for people that are well beyond athletics. If there's a young person out there or or you could go back and speak to young Joe Loman. Mm -hmm. What's the best advice that you could give them? I would say to the young Joe Loman and any, any youth that is, that is listening is you can be so much more than what society tells you. I think that because I spent 20 years of my life as a heterosexual, long haired woman who rolled her shorts and wore tight dresses. And that was because I was living the life I thought I should. And I was living within the boundaries that society presented for me. And I would go back and I would tell fifth grade Joe Loman when she's wearing her pair of Air Jordans and she feels whole in her own skin for the first time as a girl in boy basketball shoes, you can be so much more than what society tells you. And that is the message to, again, 
to have the courage to come out, to discover who you really are and to be brave enough to live as your authentic self, regardless of all the pressures that life is throwing at you. Because this world is going to try to make you someone else. And it's important that the youth hear that everybody else is taken, right? You got to be yourself and you have to really love yourself and know that you are worthy of acceptance and joy. That's wonderful. Well, you guys heard it here from Joanna Lohman. Understand the importance and the benefits of failure. Mm -hmm. find your way to come out whether that's sexuality or anything else about just not being into a, a, a box that society makes for you understand your values what else do we talk about just wrapping up here we hit everything understanding the uh the magic of molting right like a dungeness crab of growing into your own skin yes so so much yeah, good stuff and, and it, to, if you need more of a recap, find me go too. back and listen to the episode. Where can we find you, Joanna Loman? Uh, Joanna Loman .com. Also on LinkedIn is Joanna Loman. Instagram is Joanna Loman 15. Hit me up. I love kind of sharing the journey with, uh, with everyone out there. So please uh, reach out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing such a beautiful story, beautiful points of view. This has been Finding the Way. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Finding the Way with Ryan LaVarnway. Find previous episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.